Hi, welcome to the Something New Show. I'm your host, Mindy, and we like to talk about how to live a life worth celebrating. And today, I have a special guest here. Her name is Kristen Boss, and yes, that's her last name. She's pretty cool. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about her before we get into this episode. You are going to laugh a lot and have fun to hear her journey. It's so incredible. But before we do, Kristen is a coach, best-selling author, speaker, and CEO of a multi seven figure company. She became known for her anti-hustle message and teaches sustainable business strategy to online business owners without burnout, which is quite the the effort to do this without burnout. I mean, it's a lot, but I'd love to hear a little bit, Kristen. First of all, thanks for being here. Yeah. And um, tell me how you got started because we were both, I mean, I still am, but we were in the wedding industry together. You were in it for 15 years also. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I was a hairstylist for, mm, yeah, 15 years. I started in Los Angeles. I trained under some of the biggest names in the industry. I was actually like red carpet bound to do like fashion shows and all that. I was very, very good at what I did. And um, it was actually during the 2008 recession that we had uh, where there was a change in how cl- how often clients were coming in. So I had to make a pivot and I was like, all right, well, what industry is always rocking and rolling no matter what and that I can bring my skills to? And I knew, I'm like, it's weddings. I'm really good at wedding hair. Why not? So I actually started a um, a mobile before that was it, this was even a cool thing before like now I see it all over the place but a friend and I she did makeup and I was like hey let's partner together and we'll create you know a mobile come to you you know wedding hair and makeup service and we you know our first year we were like featured number one on the knot was all over Los Angeles and I think I remember that one year I I don't think I had a weekend for like eight months it was just It was bananas. So I have done probably anywhere between 500 and 1,000 weddings in my time as (laughs) as a hairstylist. So yeah, I had that life. (laughs) And then you, you at that time were towards the end there thinking like, I don't want to do hair forever. Oh yeah. Is that what happened? I mean, what was kind of stirring in you? Yeah. Great question. Um, I think it was when my husband and I moved to Colorado, I started my clientele over and I remember there was a distinct moment I don't think I had turned 30 yet. I think I was in my late 20s. And I looked around and I saw the 40-something, early 50s stylist. And they were complaining of, like, their shoulders and their backs. And, like, they were working 40 hours a week, busting their butts. And they didn't have retirement plans. And I, I looked at that and I was like, oh, my God, I don't think I want this. I think I want something else. And the part that I love the most about hair, I mean, I love the creative expression with hair. That was great. But I loved people. I loved, you know, talking to people. I had people joke with me for years, like, hey, I feel like you're my life coach. I'm like, well, the hairstylist, yes, that's kind of what we are. We're like therapists. And so I like to say I was an underpaid life coach before I stepped into coaching. So that's when I started really thinking, okay, how can I get out of, being behind the chair because I only make money when I'm actually behind the chair and there's got to be a different way to do things. And so I actually started, um, social selling, selling a product online. I had like, I had these supplements. I'm like, this is amazing. I'm having great results. And, uh, yeah, I think I made like 25 bucks. The first person I told, I was like, wait, what? I can make money online. And then I went like, I went ham on that. And so that was kind of the start of my exit out of hair and into entrepreneurship. Wow. And then um, it sounds like you received some training, right, <laughs> for that, so for selling that product online. Yeah. Tell me about what the standard of training seems to be in the industry right now. Like, what does it kind of look like versus what you realize, oh, this is a problem I can solve. So what is that training like right now? Right now? Well, I'd like to say it's changing because... Of you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but there still is going to be the outliers of, you know, when everyone like, knows. Like, what did you experience? Yeah. You, so yeah. let me tell you that um, I was told to make a list of 100 names of people. And you have something called, like, a Frank's List. Friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, and, like, kids' friends, I think it is. And you have to do this, like, memory jogger of anybody that could potentially come to mind. And then you pitch them the business. And that just felt so gross to me in so many ways. And I was already somebody that like loved social media and I was also very good at selling. In fact, um, I was just telling my son this the other day that um, I think in fourth grade, my school had like a magazine drive and I like won all the prizes for selling the most magazines because I was wanting to knock on all the doors. So I was very, very good at selling. And 
you know, I, it reached a certain point where I had other people that I, you know, encouraged to do this with me and they weren't naturally good at selling. And then they were exposed to like, okay, just send the, this copy and paste message to, you know, these people. And you just keep sending messages, go for no. Uh, and I remember like, I'm so embarrassed of this, but I remember once pulling out my high school yearbook and going through the yearbook and like sending a message to everybody in that yearbook. Like, like on Facebook was, or something? Oh my God, yes. It was so cringe. Ah, that so is so cringe. cringy. Like, I'm, I'm so I'm, sorry. I'm cringing at myself. I'm like so embarrassed. I'm like, I can't believe I did that. But well, I remember and like... And the thing is, I've been on the receiving end of that yeah. cringe. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, no, they did not reach out to me after 10 years and say, we are. We were just thinking about you the other day. And this is what I was thinking. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. You weren't thinking about us. You pulled out your yearbook is what happened. No. Yeah, I know. Now you could say that. Be like, were, did, were you in your yearbook? Did you like, yeah. am I on your prospect list? Am I on list? your prank list? Yeah, exactly. And so, um, I, I went, I went hard in that industry and I was very good. Um, but I reached a certain threshold where I would say working, you know, 80, 90 hours a week, just putting your head to the ground. Like this is what you do for the dream. And I chased it at the time. I had a two year old and a one year old. My husband was unemployed at the time. So we were financially hurting. We were like really needing it. And I burned out so bad because I was still doing hair. So I'd, you know, wake up, take care of my babies, go to the salon, work a 12 hour day on my feet, come home, bathe my kids, do dinner. And then I'd be on my laptop from 8 PM at night to 2 AM. And I did that for 18 months before like my body and my emotional health, like hit the crapper. And I was like, um, there has got to be a different way. Like the business model makes sense. Like and this is before affiliate marketing got really trendy. Um, so I was like, this makes sense to talk about something that worked for you and for you to refer out, um, but not hunt people down and treat everyone like a prospect. I remember like it got so bad where I went to park dates, like mommy play dates at the park, and I would have samples in my purse and I would just like be looking for a moment to be like, do you want my sample? <laughs> like try my sample. I was just that, but that's what was conditioned. Well, it, it, like this is, is what creates so success. Desperate. So it desperate. Like, I am like anything, right? And that's, oh, and yeah. I hate that feeling, which I mean, honestly, I have to tell you, I've considered, I've been approached by so many people over the years. And the reason why I feel like I can do what I do, because I am in sales too. Yes. But is, I see it as I have a product that someone needs and they come to me. Does that make sense? I don't go to them hunting them down. Right. I have something awesome. I talk about it online for sure. But when you're engaged and you need a wedding dress, you're going to find me because I'm the best one there is, in my opinion. Um, but I'm the best experience, the best um, showroom, the best dresses, the best girls that work with you. And so now you can come to me and find what you're looking for. But I don't have to ever go out to the park and find someone. Right. You know? Do you want to feel this chiffon? <laughs> I don't feel it's this like sample. no, I cannot. Yeah. I cannot. So I think you know if somebody's really good at selling, and that's a gift that they were given, it is so important to realize like what's the best way to land in the selling category where you don't feel sleazy. You know. Yes. Okay. So keep going. Yeah. So then I was just like, you know what? I think coaching is for me. I had hired a coach. I started reading marketing books and everything. It was like I took the red pill. Like I was woke. I was like this, that does not work. And I was, you know, thinking more and I was already somebody who was attracting a lot of people, but at the same time I was so desperate, so scarce. I was also that person like in my yearbook and all that. So I was like, I think I meant to do something else. I think I meant to coach. That's really what like lights me up. And so I started, I started coaching. I was like coaching people for free. I just started, like, I saw someone trying to launch a course online and I reached out to her. I said, Hey, like your marketing needs some cleanup. Can I just help you? I really want you to make some money. And she's like, uh, what will it cost? I'm like, nothing. Just let me help you. And she started making sales and started making money. And that based on what I was learning and I was like, I was teaching her this and then, you know, some network marketers were coming my way and saying, hey, like, how are you doing this online? I'm like, well, let me just show you. Uh, and then eventually, as I like kept growing in my coaching skills and marketing skills, um, I was like, why is nobody teaching this whole industry how to do service-based selling where they attract their leads and where they just show up online as their authentic selves um, without, and nobody has to feel gross and family and friends are not the target market. Why is nobody teaching that? And I kept waiting. I was like, someone's going to go and do it. Someone better teach that. I mean, that'd be pretty awesome. Um, and then eventually got to the point where I was just coaching one-on-one -on -one clients. And 
um, a lot of network marketers were coming my way and they really liked the approach I was taught. I was like, you know what? I'm going to create the program I wish I had when I found this this business in 2017, 2016, actually. Um, and then I did that and then it was just, and at the same time, um, when I built that program, that was right before the pandemic. And that is when like that market exploded. So there became a massive need for what I was teaching. It was, you know, I'm gonna teach you how to leverage your social media, how to build a brand, how to actually sell ethically and authentically using your voice. I'm gonna teach you content writing and copywriting and all those things that other businesses have, but this industry doesn't. And it just spread like wildfire and here we are. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say, so later. tell us, you know, without, I know you would probably not brag on yourself for a minute, but like, so you've created a course, what's it called? Yeah, it's the Social Selling Academy. It's a coaching program for social sellers who wanna, you know, learn to leverage their social media accounts and do it well. And how to build and a business. And you have people, like you've had thousands and thousands of people go yeah. through this academy, right? Yeah, I think I, I'm just under 5,000 students right now, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. And you do live events with them too? Yeah. Right? Do live events. I've got a live event next month. Um, I do a lot of keynote speaking for the company. So those companies now hire me. I now consult for, you know, the, uh, the corporate people that are doing the corporate training to train their field. They're often bringing me in and being like, okay, well, uh, Chris and boss needs to look at this and like, is, does this serve the field and is this relevant to where we're going? And I, it's funny. I just did a state of the union for social sellers saying like, hey, here's what you need to know about the landscape right now because we are officially post-pandemic and the climate has drastically changed and if you don't adapt, you will get left behind. And I even use the analogy of like um, churches because my husband was a pastor for a while and there was like, listen, if you wanna keep holding on to your choir robes, you can, but right now, today's you know, person that wants to walk in a church building, they're expecting the coffee shop in the lobby. They want the fog machines and they want the drum set. And if you aren't willing to do that and you want to hold to the choir robes and the hymns, you might hurt. You might, your business might mm. slow down or die. And like what you do have you to see, adapt or die. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? What do you see for the landscape of social selling? What yeah. Do you see? So what it used to be is it used to be, you know, when someone was talking about their favorite, like weight loss shake or something, they'd be competing with other direct sales companies, so to speak. And the influencer used to be seen as like this very elite, like, oh, she has a million followers, you know, um, and I think people had a bad taste in their mouth with influencer. They think of like this overly curated, present my life as perfect. Filtered. Yep, overly filtered. Um, but what's happening this year is something called the anti-influencer or de-influencing. And so it's actually, th these are the two trends. One is de-influencing is I'm going to talk people out of buying products that I don't think are worth it. So I think that's pretty fascinating because what people got tired of is people and this is what's happening, like influencers kind of came under, you know, a line of heat because they were just promoting product and people were like, but do you actually use this product? Yeah, it's like a paid Or ad. are you just making this money? Right. Paid and ad. is this a quality product? So now people are de-influencing and saying like, well, I've tried the product and here's why it's worth your money. Here's why it's not. And then that kind of created the rise of the anti-influencer where they call it like the non-aesthetic feeds that are happening right now. It's like, I want to see your non-aesthetic get ready with me in the morning. Um, of course, the aesthetic like get ready with me is still trending, but there's a, a kind of a newer trend where people are wanting more honesty from the influencers, from people who are showing up online. So what that's done is created a really nice open door for social sellers um, because now it's no longer the influencers versus social sellers. It's actually anyone can be an affiliate right now. Like they can, you know, HelloFresh, they can, you know, have their partnership or a paid ad for that. And so now it's for social sellers. They're now, you know, learning to step up and it's between them and an affiliate now. And they, and I've told them, I was like, you need to actually position yourself as an affiliate because you have to be brand forward and not People can't know you for being like the weight loss shake lady or the pink drink lady or the leggings lady. Like they want to know you because of the value that you provide in the world. So we're in a very value forward economy right now just because, you know, people, they have less than eight second attention spans. So I've been telling content creators, I was like, listen, you got to hook people fast because we're in a, an attention deficit economy. Um, so you got to be good. And I've told social sellers, I'm like, you are no longer a social seller. You're a content creator in this economy. And if you're not willing to make that pivot, that's fine. Maybe the business isn't for you or you have to be more, you know, belly to belly in person. 
Wow. Yeah. Okay, Kristen, I follow you on Instagram, and I'm <laughs> always inspired. There's a post I'm going to tell people about in just a second that I was inspired by. But before I do, where do you um, get your creativity and your ideas? I mean, are you do you consume some content places, or are you just, like, sitting in your office, and you're like, I have a great idea. Like, I mean, where are you getting your kind of bright ideas, and um, what suggestions do you have for people when they're trying to think creatively? What, what's your process like? So I am obsessed with solving problems, so I am always looking for problems, being like, okay, based on what social media is doing right now, what are the problems? And I'm constantly listening to the market, being like, what am I hearing people complain about? What am I hearing them being stuck with? Um, I'm also, <laughs> people might say not to do this, but I go and read people that have negative thoughts about the industry I serve, I go and I actually read their stuff. And I'm like, why do they have that experience? And how can I help make this better over there? And so I look for problems. Um, I, I sit down and I think about my clients all the time. And I'm like, okay, where are they stuck? Um, and I have five questions I, I'm always asking. What do they want? Why don't they have it? What have they tried before? What do they need to do next? Uh, maybe it's just four questions, but those, when I ask myself those questions, I get so much creativity and it helps with like knowing who I'm serving. So yeah, really being like acquainted. Yeah. Closely. Intimate with your people. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, um, you know, one of our guests back, um, said that they think about information in two ways. It's either a vitamin, in, a vitamin or a painkiller. Mm. And so it's either like helpful because it's going to prevent you from making a mistake or it's a painkiller because it's killing pain. It sounds like your approach is really painkiller. Oh, it's yeah. like, it's like they're dealing with something. There's something out there. Somebody's complaining or whatever. And then you're going to solve that. You're going to like kill that pain. Yeah. As quickly as possible. <laughs> I love that. Well, we've even started saying it in a staff meeting. We're like, Hey, we're about to share some training with you. It's going to be either a vitamin or a painkiller. And it's been a great, mm, like just it. mindset shift of like, okay, I'm about to hear something that is going to prevent a problem, and so here's some training. Or mm -hmm. this problem happened, so this is how we're going to solve it. <laughs> so um, I think that's really crucial for when we're thinking about our content that we're creating as business owners or people just thinking, okay, like, we got to bring something helpful yep. to people. Mm -hmm. And if it is helpful, then it's great. So actually, it brings me to my favorite post that you've ever posted and it was um and I, I'm gonna do it I'm gonna copy you I hope you're okay okay it. do it um but um in the bridal industry I just think this could go bonkers I just I loved when you said who would like a free Instagram audit audit yeah what tell yeah. me the results from that post because oh my I gosh. lost track I lost track I had to like go to bed I was like oh my gosh look at this going crazy but you, yeah first of all what do you say in your post you said something like um you know this is what I would like to look over what were yeah. the things you wanted to audit do they have an optimized bio like when somebody looks at their you know Instagram at first glance do they know am I the person you serve do you solve the problem I'm actively you know working on like essentially what am I going to get from your from your content so do they have an optimized bio meaning like search engine friendly as well if someone was to search the content would their profile show up um, what is their value ratio? Meaning how much of their content is giving versus how much is asking. And if they're asking more than they're giving, that's a not good value ratio. You always want to give 80% give 20% ask. I'm taking notes. Yeah. So Gary, Gary V has this saying, it's called the jab, jab, jab hook, um, where it's like the give, 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 ask. And so I love the value ratio of 80% give 20% ask, uh, because you, you put enough, you know, I kind of view it as like a bank account. Like, have I put enough value deposits to make a withdrawal um, mm -hmm. on my audience? Yeah. Um, you know, is there, are they doing niche-based content? Like, is it very clear who they're talking to? If I were to come to their content, would I know who they're talking to and how they're helping them within 10 seconds? And is their content continuity? Meaning, is all of their con does their content line up with who they say they help? So, for example, there was an audit I did, and she said, like, I do, you know, emotional health and self-awareness. And I was like, that's a great, you know, and for women in their mid-40s, I was like, oh, that's fantastic. Love it. Then I went and scrolled her content, 
And none of the content had that. All of the content, she was actually a hairstylist and all of her content was all hair. And I said, there is a massive disconnect. You had me in the bio, but then when I go to the content, I'm now I'm just confused. Being like, are you a hairstylist? Are you trying to sell me hair products? I couldn't even figure out what was going on. And then she had a link in the bio and I, and I say, do you have a link that is a give or is it an ask? So a link in the bio would be like, what is something to capture a lead to get them on your email list because social media is rented land. If anything happens on social media, you do not own any of your followers. So building an email list is key. So I'm like, okay, do you have an opt-in of something to give them where, because I tell people, listen, people aren't just going to give you their email address. They want to know they're getting something valuable in exchange. So you're going to build an opt-in, a freebie, an ebook, you know, your favorite recipes, a download, right? So is it a give or an ask? And on that account, it was an ask. It was just a straight link to her product shop. Now, If it was actually an e-commerce account, that's not a problem. Like someone that sells jewelry on their Instagram, I would expect the shop link to be there. I wouldn't expect like, you know, an opt-in for a jewelry shop. I'm clearly there to buy jewelry. But when we're talking about a brand forward business, a person, because now people, they buy because of, you know, do I like you? Not like, because they could buy a weight loss shake anywhere, but they're going to buy because, hey, man, I really love that you talk about, you know, emotional health. And I actually applied the things in the download you told me to do and it worked. Now I have a, this has created a bridge of trust that didn't exist before. And so now if you tell me, you know, this other thing you love, I'll try that. Turns out I love that too. Now you're going to tell me about your weight loss shake. Okay. Now we have so much stored trust. I'm an automatic yes. And now I'm going to show up in your DMs and say, girl, just let me buy it. Or I might not even show up in your DMs. I'll just click the link and you'll be like, oh, Kristen's a new customer. That's awesome. And you didn't have to go through your Frank list. And you didn't have to go through your Frank list or your yearbook. Amazing. My Lord. <laughs> Amazing. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? thought that the customer can come to you what? <laughs> if you just create something so awesome yeah. on there. I love it. So so what kind of, okay, so going back to your post, what kind of results did you see oh from my that gosh. post? Like, let's be real. Well, let's just go, it goes to show. It's so funny because I created a follow-up post for it, but I was like, I, I'm offering to do a free Instagram audit where I'll look for these things. I think in just the first 15 minutes, I had 800 comments or something wackadoodles like that. I think I'm still getting people being like, hey, can you send me a free Instagram on? I was like, it's closed. I think I got over 3,000 comments and it was just, and it was so okay, funny. If you're <laughs> listening to podcasts and not watching this on YouTube right now, my jaw is like <laughs> on the floor. That is so ridiculous, the response yeah. to that. And I mean, that's lead generating 100%. Oh, yeah. I can't even, I'm like mind blown. Yeah. So, you know, I was looking through a bunch of stuff and, you know, but then I created a follow-up post and I just called my audience out. I was like, you bunch of freeloaders. I was like, y'all got to engage here. Give me some likes on comments when I'm giving you some value. But, you know, when you come in and to get something, you know, and like the response from that was amazing too, because they're like, oh my gosh, yeah, you're right. Sorry, you called us out. Like, we're just here for the free stuff. And I was like, Yes, but also, you know, so, so um, comment and like on every yeah, single thing. And I had and so to, if you're listening to this this video on YouTube right now, <laughs> comment and like on it, right? Yeah, give a like, give a follow. Here, but here's why. And I had to actually educate my audience the value of engaging because we have so many right now. We are our consumers and just people who are on social media. They're in consumption overload right now. And so their like likes are getting harder to earn on social media because they're just, they're scrolling so fast, watching so fast. They're not taking a minute to like, like, let alone leave a comment and say, this is so applicable. This is so good. And what I had to educate them and say, I said, Hey, listen, it's not about my ego. My ego can totally survive my metrics. What it actually is about is you giving me feedback so I know what more to create. When there's a lot of likes, there's a lot of comments, what that tells me is that you value that, and so I'm going to go more in depth on that subject or create more for you. But if you're not engaging, what you're not doing is providing me the necessary feedback to serve you. And so they were like, oh, yeah, I should probably engage. (laughs) That's awesome, though, and I love that you tell them that because they do need to know, and who else is telling them? No one. No one. No No one. Oh, so I love that. Okay. Um, And then what else would you say right now is just really, you're seeing like, oh, this is really working for the climate of our, of our online. Is there anything else that comes to mind? Um, You know, this is just super time sensitive. So I don't know if it'll be like when, if someone watches this six months from now, but Facebook reels are like, 
far outperforming Instagram right now. So I'm telling people, I'm like, hey, don't get locked up in one platform. Like, be willing to go everywhere, YouTube, TikTok, you know, all those things. And I also tell people, like, you got to figure out where your people are hanging out. Um, you know, millennials, we are very Instagram driven. Gen Z, they're on TikTok. And so and be real. They're on be real. What is be real? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm like, how do Gen I not Z know this? Is what be is real? Be real. So be real. And I'm still figuring it out too. So okay. if you're out there, don't be like, oh, Mindy knows. She doesn't really know. She's um, maybe having imposter syndrome right now. But I know <laughs> that a lot of Gen Z people will be in my store shopping here and um, they're taking a little picture and they love it because be real, the, like you're not really supposed to do filters. It's, it's oh, not yeah. supposed to be, it's yep. supposed to be real. So anti-influencer. Yes. Yes. Okay. And so, um, it's like, what are you doing right now? And you actually curate a friend group with inside of be real. And so you're only sharing with those people. So, I mean, you oh. could still have a thousand people in there, but it's like your, it's kind of like the follower thing, except for when you're public, anybody can follow you. Right. Right. But this is like a chosen, like you choose <laughs> who is in your be real group Got and it. then you're sharing real moments with them that are supposed to be not, um, beautiful. They're just like, they're just like, like this is what I'm doing right now. And it could be like, this sucks or this is great or whatever. But then I also think I could be wrong on this, but I don't think it like lasts. I think it like kind of goes away. Like kind of like, like a story, like 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure the details, but I'm, I am investigating be real right now as you should, because I'm like this generation, they don't want to be on Instagram. They feel like it's fake. Well, okay. yes, okay. with what they've Which seen, but they're, it's, it, it's in a pivot right now. The de-influencing and anti-influencer is very relevant to 2023 right now. Um, I will also say what's taking off is memes, like using pop culture relevant memes. If you've seen my Instagram recently, I've just been kind of using like, cause I've been trying to work with more Gen Z as well. And I was like, okay, where, and even like nineties throwbacks to like really get my people thinking. And so I like have a SpongeBob meme that's about to go out. And I'm like, I know Gen Z will love that. And here's a perfect example. There was a reel that showed up that went totally viral and it was a Honda car dealership. And it said like my manager telling me not to do, to take my, you know, the social media account seriously. And there was a bouncing cat in the background with like the goofiest music and it went totally viral. And I think it has like nine, maybe 8 million views. And like this person has done so much of that, like campy memes, pop culture references, like tacky, tacky stuff. And their following is growing. And that dealer, I'm like, I'm following a dealership in Oregon that I'm never going to buy a car from. But what's so funny is I've been even watching the comments. I'm like, okay, so what are the consumers saying about content like this? They're all saying, we're here for this. It's hilarious. This is what's working. And I started testing out my own audience again. So I'm watching consumer behavior. I'm looking at the comments of viral reels and be like, so why did this go viral? Um, and just making and rethinking, okay, how do I need to recreate this for my audience? So this is kind of where some creativity also comes from, like sitting back and being a consumer of your own stuff. Mm. You know, um, I think someone had once told me they actually is one of my students. She was on maternity leave and she's like, it was kind of a good thing. She didn't work her business for 90 days, but she decided to like investigate her business as a consumer. And she found all of these things that she couldn't see when she was too in her business. Like, oh, that's confusing for our customers. We have to change that. I'm confused by this. And so sometimes just stepping out of being a business owner and sitting with your content, sitting with your business and be like, what would someone that's brand new to this think about this? Yeah. What would they think we specialize in or we're the best at, or is this even a service they provide? Right. And, and I agree with you. I mean, even in my industry, it's crazy because you can, you can be shocked going to different websites and being like, oh, I had no idea that they did this because on their Instagram, it doesn't talk about it or mm -hmm. vice versa. Um, I've also seen people just totally neglect the call to actions. So it's like, well, what do they even want me to do? I have no idea. Do they want me to call to book an appointment? Do they want me to, you know, just look at pretty pictures? Like what's the goal here? And so I think just making it so simple. I mean, I was coached one time to make it, make everything, whether it's math, you know, the deal that you're offering or whatever it might be to a second grade level, which seems so crazy to me, but they're mm -hmm. like, make it that easy to understand that this is what you do. This is what you pay for. This is the deal that it is. Like they've even told me, don't put a percentage off, do dollars off because people yes. can actually do the math better. Yes. For you know, it's like, 
Oh, like it's crazy to think we have to do second grade simplicity. However, because I think of the attention span, the eight seconds, that's why it has to be so simple. The Mm -hmm. attention span is eight seconds. So let's put that together. So what can you get out of a thought in eight seconds? Mm -hmm. Probably second grade simplicity. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's really cool. I think across the board, whatever industry, just thinking through, okay, what content, content am I creating and how is it best suited for my audience? Um, okay. Let's talk for a second about this book. Yeah. Okay. So Kristen was so kind to give me her book today, pivot to purpose, leaving the toxic hustle culture behind. So instead of reading the back, I want you to tell me in person what this is all about. Yeah. So it was really me deciding to go head on against hustle culture that is so normal in our society that, you know, you have to work 24 seven to accomplish your dreams, sacrifice sleep, sacrifice your mental health, sacrifice, uh, the things that you value. It's kind of like, I remember I kind of lived by the mantra of like work hard, I'll sleep when I die type of thing. And that like, it's no wonder it got to the point where like I had adrenal fatigue. I was like emotionally spent, um, such a lack of boundaries in my life. My relationships were suffering. So, you know, I, when I decided to start my business, I was like, I'm not going to buy into that narrative anymore that I have to like sacrifice those things, you know, work harder, grind, grind, grind. I just um, want to, I just want to affirm you. Yeah. I was told sleep when you're dead too. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, but I think that's what, uh, you know, and to be honest, I feel like entrepreneurship and business, like I was only exposed to what I'm going to call maybe a more masculine narrative of like, you know, grind it out and just go and the, you know, survival of the fittest type of thing. And I think we, as women, I think we buy into that because we're, we, if we don't have other examples, we just buy into like whatever is being said. Yeah. And so for me, I remember watching YouTube videos and motivational speakers and all they talked about was like, you got to hustle, you got to work, you got to do these things. And I just bought it hook, line and sinker, not thinking about like, is this actually sustainable? And what happens if I do like work my butt off and I don't get the results that I thought I would get. And that's what happened to me. It was, you know, I hit major, major burnout. I didn't hit the results that I was promised. If I just put my nose to the grinder, You're like, and I did put my yeah, nose to the grinder. I did. I did all of the things and all I have is I'm left with misery and regret and insomnia and adrenal fatigue. Like this is not worth it. And so the idea of, you know, moving to pivot to purpose is learning to work from a different place, not, not working from scarcity, working from like abundance and gratitude and playing the long game. I teach so many people because a lot of times people, when they start, uh, their business or entrepreneurs, like oftentimes what they are doing is building, you know, an exit strategy to maybe a better vision for their life, a more rich vision for their life. And so, but if you aren't grounded in gratitude, what you are actually looking, looking to entrepreneurship as, as like an escape hatch from temporary pain in your life that you aren't willing to acknowledge. And so I, that that was me. Say that just one more time for people in the back. Yeah. Say that one more time. So I think it's very common for people who start a business and entrepreneurs What they are really looking for is an escape hatch from temporary pain they're experiencing in their life that they're not willing to address. It's like if I could just outrun my pain, because the story they're telling themselves is when I have a million dollars, when I make all the money, when I have all the success, everything I'm feeling right now will go away. Will go away. And I have had to tell people, I'm like, you don't, and there's a chapter in my book where I talk about, you know, when I had made a million dollars, I remember looking in the mirror and it was like, if you're like, remember your birthday, you look in the mirror and you're like, I don't feel a year older. I don't look a year older. I, I especially remember that, like my 21st birthday, like this is such a big deal. And I was like, well, I feel no different. It's still me. Money is the same way. Like it cannot bring you that. It cannot bring you that inner peace. So talking about working from a different place with purpose and from the heart of service and playing the long game and not just trying to quick fix and really what you're just trying to outrun is yourself. And that was me. I was just outrunning my low self-worth, my self-esteem. I was just out running a version of me I wasn't willing to contend with at the time. And so when you are decide to pivot to purpose and become an, a person who embraces anti-hustle, like what you are actually letting go of is, you know, productivity defining your worth. And this isn't something, by the way, you don't just heal from it. Like I like to say I'm a recovering hustler (laughs) because I still am always going to have like my hustle tendencies. Fear is going to still pop up. Anxiety is going to come up. But the book is really about like, here's all the tools that I wish someone had given me when I started. Wow. 
And it's for anyone that it's, is yeah. working, really. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's not just entrepreneurs. I would assume that that works for anyone that. Yeah. I actually, I actually had somebody um, message me and she was like a world-class um, violin player. And she was like, this is, e this even is relevant to me as a violinist. And if that's, if that's what they call it. Um, but she's like, this changed so much of my own perspective. I've had someone that graduated uh, from an Ivy league and they're a very prestigious lawyer. It was like, this spoke to me. So, but when I wrote it, I just spoke from my lens as an entrepreneur. I didn't know it was going to help people literally in all walks. And, um, I thought mostly women were going to read it. And I've had some men send messages, like not, not the weird DMS, but like, Hey, just so you know, this is relevant for me too. This is great. Thank you. That's so, so yeah, great. that's yeah. so great. Okay. Well, I want you to think about just, if we could leave our listeners with just maybe a tip or two, um, as they're trying to maybe enhance all that they're doing, whether it's from their personal life, their professional life, maybe their social selling, it doesn't matter. Just think of something that you really feel like has been a good deposit for people in your realm recently. And before we leave those tips, where can we find more from Kristen Boss? Yeah, so you can just follow me on Instagram at the Kristen Boss. I also have a podcast. It's called the Kristen Boss Show or the Kristen Boss Podcast. Um, and so you could just find me there or kristenboss.com. I love that because yeah. maybe people want to go hear you speak at your next event. Maybe they do. That'd be amazing. Okay, so yeah, what would we leave our friends with today just if you think about how to live a life worth celebrating that you're like, hey, this is just some, some hard knocks, but I've learned this. I want to leave this tip with you today. Yeah, so the first one would be how could I change the way I feel about my life without changing a single thing about my life? If you are willing to do that work, you will experience so much more abundance and richness in your life. Uh, the second one would be um, this thing I'm going after right now, whatever it is, if it took me twice as long as I thought it would, would I still do it and why? Uh, and the third thing is probably mm, this thing I'm going after. If it's a lot harder or more painful than, uh, than I thought it would be, would I still go after it and why? Um, those are the three things I'm always sitting with and giving my students. So that's what I would leave with your people. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you, Kristen. So yeah. now we're going to transition to a fun part of the show yeah. where we bring out our guest favorite drink and I get to try it. So yeah. what is our, what is our drink today, Kristen? So this is a flat white latte, whole milk, uh, a blonde espresso with cinnamon and some brown sugar. And it is just Num num. <laughs> okay, I love it. Well, let's cheers to that. Cheers. cheers. I'm gonna try her favorite drink. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And it's not like overly cinnamony, which we were worried about. No. Because they they literally shaved the cinnamon <laughs> off and put it in our coffee today. But yeah. that's delicious. Thank yeah. you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you are a, a stellar person and seriously inspiring. Even though I don't get to hang out with you as much as I'd like, we are friends <laughs> Let's online. Let's change that. <laughs> we could change that, and we're friends online as well, and um, in a mastermind together, which has been so awesome. So again, I'm just so glad that she joined us today. I'm sure you guys got some great um, content from that. So if you had a thought or a question, definitely leave it in the comments below, like and share with your friends. But again, thanks for being with us today on the Something New Show, where we like to learn how to live a life worth celebrating. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the show rate, review, and share with a friend. Also, follow The Something New Show on Instagram and Facebook. If you want a fuller experience, watch the show on YouTube to help you create a life worth celebrating.